the worm, the very ingredient of life itself. Delicio. I take my work very seriously, cela construe mi carrière. Magnificent, si très important. You've heard of escargot, but this, this is escarworm. Je ne suis pas fou. I'm not crazy, it's very important. I'm not crazy. Je ne suis pas fou. This video is sponsored by Squarespace and we're gonna talk about that later. In this video, I will teach you how to become the worm king, which involves some interesting procedural geometry node stuff. So I'm gonna show you how to make a worm. And before we begin, I just wanna say that all the uh, project files are gonna be available, which isn't just like the worm, but it's also like the 20 shot files of this project. Pick it up at cgmatter.com. <laughs> it's one of the best ways to support financially, and you get a lot for it. Let's do the tutorial now. The interesting thing about this effect is that there's only two components. The first of which is simply deciding what path the worm is going to travel in. So let's say this is the worm over here. It has some length, and it has the knowledge to progress along this path. The next part is making it look good, so adding those kind of ridges that you see in a worm and stuff like that. If you want more detail, warning, I'm about to show some images, you can take a close close-ups and see what they uh, look like. For me, the secret is going to be subsurface scattering. To make a path, I'm going to add a Bezier curve. We can add a subdivision just to add some kind of like interest in the path and let's up the quality of this. This path is going to become a Geonodes object. And how do we get a worm to travel along this curve? Super simple. I'm going to use the trim curve node, which look at that. We now have like a worm right here. If we offset both of these travel along the path. When I thought of this, I'm like genius. To get this animation to happen over time, so you see, I'm just adding both values. For the start frame or the start time, I'm going to add a time node. Make this take much longer by making time five times slower. And you can think of this end point as the length of the worm, which we can just add a bit of an offset to. Let's make our worm 0.2 units in time. Very strange. Uh, but now we have a worm progressing. This can be our worm generator. We'll call it worm. To make it wiggle, I just need to add some like offset, some noise basically, so it can face different directions. I'm going to set position, which lets me alter the position. Instead of just plugging in noise directly, I swear I say this every single time, you can see this moves up and to the right. Noise goes from zero to one on the X, Y, and Z axis, which means it's not centered. And to center that, I just, you know, subtract by 0.5, which you can see seems to not be working because interestingly enough, this curve is only composed of two points, kind of like a start and an end point, even though it has so much shape. Well, maybe we just take this and add a bunch of divisions. As we up this, kind of ups the visual quality. Don't be afraid to go up to like 500 or something like that. Of course, I want to take the scale of this vector or this offset, make it a bit tinier, and then let's kind of smooth this out. So a low amount of detail, a lower amount of scale, and then a lower amount of strength. Just like that, you can see we have wiggle, although it looks very weird. It's almost like there's this like noise field it's traveling through. And I don't know, it doesn't seem like it's wiggling across its body. Well, interestingly, a curve will always have something called a spline parameter. This is a way to parameterize the curve where we start at zero at one endpoint, we progress, and then at the very end, we have a value of one. Here it's 0.5, here it's 0 0.25, 0 0.75. This is a spline parameter, which can give us coordinates along a curve. I'm going to bring in the spline parameter. We care about this factor. And this is kind of the best visual I can give you. So you can see it's black here, white here, and it maintains that uh, no matter where it is uh, moving. In other words, the big insight is that this noise can be one dimensional. It only cares about a single number. And that number is going to be the spline parameter. So now you can see as it travels, it maintains its shape, which of course, look silly, but if we play with these numbers, make it less ridiculous, I can then take this spline parameter and add a bit of offset, just like we did with the trim curve. And now you can see it's wiggling in a way where this is kind of the source of the perturbation that travels along this uh, curve. You can also have it go in reverse. It's almost like a rope where the, the slack or the wave goes along the uh, arc. This is great because I can also animate this over time. If it's too fast, same as before. We take this and make it, I don't know, 10 times slower, something like that. That seems to be too slow. Let's 
let's make it two times slower. And now it looks like it's moving with this like sort of uh, intention. And yeah, this is something I like. So there we go. We now have this traveling along a path, which by the way, we can edit. So now the worm's going this way. We can also like duplicate this curve. So now we have uh, two worms, which is how I made all the worms at once. It's uh, a fast way to do it. This can be called our wiggle, which by the way, we should expose some parameters for. So this is going to be the speed of it or really the inverse of speed, how much we're dividing by. This can be the scale of our noise, noise strength, noise speed, which I'll add a note that this is the reciprocal. Now you can see we have that information. And then for the worm, let's add the speed and then this uh, length offset, length speed. Now we have everything we need to make uh, custom looking worms. Okay, let's make the radius. Because this is a curve, I can go from a curve to a mesh dynamically as this plays. And then the profile curve can be something like a circle, which should be much, much tinier, maybe even 0.01. Now this has thickness. Of course, it needs work. It needs tapering right here. So it gets smaller. Same thing over here. But remember, we still have this spline parameter quantity. And the reason I emphasize that is we can now change the curve radius. In other words, how thick this is, not just as a uniform number, but along the spline parameter. For example, if I was to add a spline parameter here, now you can see it's kind of this Gabriel horn. It kind of tapers and it looks more like an eel. Of course, I want it to be of uniform thickness in the middle and then taper at the endpoints. We can very easily draw this ourselves with a RGB curves. This is what I mean. You can kind of like draw it in a way that visually makes sense. So I'm just going to make something that kind of looks like a mound. In the middle over here, it's going to be a maximum thickness and then zero at these endpoints. And let's just kind of play around with this shape until we like the look of it. And now we have this nice uh, tapering. And then finally, I want to add these ridges of uh, visual interest. I'm just going to add a bit of a sine wave, a bit of a up and down. Along this um, spline parameter, I can use this to drive a sine wave, which as we increase the period, decrease the period, I want more oscillations. So I'm just going to multiply by like a big number. As we do that, you can see we get this like up and down, kind of like the beads of a necklace or something like that. We have this, which goes from positive one to negative one, because the sine wave goes from positive one to negative one. This is something I want to center. Going from negative one to positive one, let's go from something like 0.5 to one. That way it has thickness at every single point. And then we're going to take this and also use the thing from before to close these holes. I like this contribution. I like the other contribution. And let's just take those and combine them via like a multiplication. I'm going to bump this up a lot. So we have a lot of these. I'm going to modify kind of like the strength of this, which is super easy because I can just kind of play around with these numbers until they look good. And because it's uh, super thin, let's take this uh, curve circle and just double the radius of it. Now, something you might be seeing is that there's a really big uniformity over here. So it kind of looks like a pipe, like a air duct kind of thing. So instead of hooking up the spline parameter directly into this like sine wave, let's add a bit of perturbation. I'm going to take the spline parameter, drive it through a noise texture that should be one dimensional, hook that up there. And now you can see we have this like variation that uh, you can play with. How do I want to do this? I think I want to add detail and I think I want to add roughness, which will break up the pattern and just add visual interest, I guess. And notice this still maps on to the uh, worm as it moves, because ultimately it is dependent on this spline parameter. And look at that. That is our traveling worm boy. I love it. I'm ready to eat it. So there's a worm. There's a worm. There's a worm. And they are all moving. I'll bite it. They look the same, but you can vary it per curve. Let's make it look fancy. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, which is a convenient tie-in because recently I've been upgrading my website, cgbanner.com. This is where I host the blend files you heard me talk about and all this. And I use the Squarespace uh, platform to run the payments and all that kind of stuff. Specifically, there are three use cases I can vouch for because I use them. And to explain these, what you have to understand is I'm using this website as kind of like a Patreon alternative. And part of that is having early access videos, which is where the asset browser comes in because I can store the video files or pictures or whatever is relevant directly on there. Second of all, because this is a payment set trick subscription platform, Squarespace payments comes in real handy. They just accept all credit cards and all that right off the bat. And thirdly, I can speak to the process of designing, whether you're making your page by dragging around blocks. What I've had more fun doing personally is doing this like HTML thing. Here's a quick preview of one of the uh, posts. If AI is your thing, you can write content that way. So you can go to Squarespace to make a website. And if you want to take that and follow through, there's a, a link in the description where you can save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Let's uh, talk about worms. So here I've set up a basic scene and cycles. There's a light source and HDRI and all of this. And I want to make a nice worm material. First instinct is you make a material, you call it worm, you play around with some knobs and you see it doesn't do anything. The reason for that is this material is not applied to the object, even though it is. This is because geometry nodes is funky. You need to 
to set material to any new geometry that's created. And we did create new geometry. So I'm going to set material. I'm going to call it worm. And now you can see things are reflected. The first thing we might want to do is we might want to color the swarm along the spline parameter again. Well, to get that information over here, I'm going to store that piece of information. So store named attribute, the spline parameter. We can literally just call that parameter. And the beauty of this is when I go to attribute, I type in parameter and view it. I now have that information that is mapped onto the object. Just like before, I'm going to drive this with a noise texture where this is the coordinate one dimensionally. Let's bring up the scale of that. And now we have like an interesting pattern, which you can make even more interesting by breaking it up. This can be red. This can be green. I feel like uh, worm colors, you get kind of this earthy tone, which I guess should be darker. And then you get the same thing, but it's basically brighter, maybe with less saturation. Already that looks much better. The next order of business, and this is my my secret, so keep it, keep it secret. Uh, we're going to add subsurface scattering. What is subsurface scattering? Well, let me increase it. It's this thing. It's kind of like this see through the hand kind of effect. And an earthworm, very translucent. Light would just shine right through it. You'd see the blood. Yes, worms have red blood, turns out. So my effect should have had blood. I'm going to add subsurface, but you can see it's kind of overwhelming, even if I make it subtle. The reason it's overwhelming is with subsurface, light penetrates the object. And in this case, the object is super thin. So the light just escapes immediately. And this is especially the case because I made the scene to scale. So this worm is like an inch long. This platform is like four inches wide. What that means is I can take this number that says how much should the light penetrate and make it a number that's reasonable. So when we set the scale to zero, the effect goes away. And as we subtly increase it, you can kind of see that blood. So let's say that light goes through, I don't know, like one centimeter. So I'm just going to write one centimeter and notice this uses real scale coordinates. So you can think of this radius as the color red, green, blue. I'm just going to add a tiny bit of green. I feel like this is better than it was before. Without subsurface, with subsurface, it really is the secret ingredient. Next up, worms are shiny unless they're covered in dirt, but this one's shiny. So I'm going to take the roughness and bring it down and I have that slippery look. It might be a good idea to not only play with the roughness of this, where this reflection is, but to also play with, what am I going to say, where there is reflection in the first place? This is of course controlled by the specular. So zero specular means no shiny, max specular means very shiny. Maybe instead of point five, this can vary along the surface, which of course we have control of with this parameter. So maybe we take this noise texture and use it for another thing. We outsource it. The mix between, I don't know, a little shiny and very shiny. Connect that here. And now the shininess isn't perfectly uniform, but it kind of, I don't know, I can't really tell the difference. So maybe it would be useful to not only make this a one dimensional effect that goes along the curve, but like a two dimensional effect, almost like we have UV coordinates, which because we generated this geometry, we do not have. In geometry nodes, I don't only want to store the parameter of the curve, but also the profile curve, the one that gives it thickness. This one, the one that controls that cross section look of it. Just store the parameter. I'll call this parameter two. And just like before, you connect that and now we have that information. Literally, I can bring in a new attribute. I'll call that parameter two. And now not only do we have the parameter along this curve, but also what did I do wrong? I did wrong by not giving it a new name, parameter two. So now you can see we also have this like radial thing. I can combine this as a red, an X and a green, a Y coordinate. And now we've created a UV map for this. What that means is I, I can now have a new noise texture that is actually based on a two dimensional coordinate system. I don't know. You, you can see what's going on more than this. Very detailed. Also, this still looks very stretched along the surface. Just like with any coordinate system, I can just play with it by multiplying the X parameter by something like that. Now it's more uniform. I'm going to take this and, you know, make it higher contrast. And this can really define where it is and isn't shiny. So I'm just going to replace this here. We have either not very shiny at like 0.2 or very shiny at 0.8. And now can you see it? It's subtle, but I don't know. I can see it now. It's not perfectly shiny everywhere. And to really emphasize this, I can take this thing we made and also create a normal map. So those coincide. Take this bad boy, make it a normal map. Look at that. It's a normal map where it actually looks like there's dirt on the surface. Connect that to the normal, view it. And that is what is up. Now we have real control over this. Honestly, this is enough, but we can go much further. So remember how I said that worms are kind of like translucent and stuff like that. Maybe we can make it see through by adding some translucency. So that looks like that. You can see right through it. It kind of looks like a gummy bear. I can bring in these colors from before and maybe this normal map from before. Let's brighten up those colors so that we really get that translucency. And yeah, I like that gummy look that this does not have. And maybe I mix the twain and just find that number. I mean, that's a worm. Final detail. Maybe let's add this dirt to the color itself. Mix in the color black by how much by this much. So let's see that. Now it has some dirty dirt dirt. Make that less intense. And that, my friends, is a dirty looking worm.
worm. And remember, we have motion on this. So this isn't just like a worm that looks nice. It's a worm that looks nice in motion. Now, as for the photography aspect of it, worms are tiny, which means it's hard to get a camera close to it. So a realistic shot of this would have a focal length of, I don't know, 140. This is how you'd actually film the thing. And because it's so close, and the focal length and all this, you would have a very shallow depth of field. It would be really hard to keep this whole thing in focus. Easy enough, I add some depth of field, which immediately <laughs> destroys this because it's so shallow. I'm going to take this distance, which says what is in focus, put that really close. So maybe like at the head, let's say we're at F7. I mean, that's still really aggressive, isn't it? Maybe there's a lot of light. Maybe we can let it be F13. This, this is what I'm talking about, boys. We need dirt. So texture haven, that is the place to get textures, not to be confused with the other haven. I want dirt. Is that an option here? Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. What would a worm be in? Yeah, that works. Pro tip, you select the uh, principal BSDF, control shift T, assuming you have node wrangler. And this lets you bring in a bunch of textures at once. I like the albedo. I like the normal. I like this roughness. Bring that in. Now we have dirt. Scale that boy up so it's much tinier. Maybe add the subtle amount of displacement, which yeah, we are so out of the weeds here or in the weeds. Uh, you need to enable displacement. The scale needs to be really low so that it barely opens. I can actually get rid of the other faces. Take this and divide it. Once you do an operation, by the way, you hold shift R uh, to repeatedly do it. It's really hard to get the look right, but this is pretty good, isn't it? That's the best I can do live. I'm calling it. So again, you can get the project files at cgmatter.com. Not just the thing we made together today, but the original worm asset I used, the 20 VFX shot, je m'assis pas fou, and uh, goodbye.